Welcome to Influential Entrepreneurs, bringing you interviews with elite business leaders and experts, sharing tips and strategies for elevating your business to the next level. Here's your host, Mike Saunders. Hello and welcome to this episode of Influential Entrepreneurs. This is Mike Saunders with Marketing Huddle, and today we have with us Carl Gould, who is an author, speaker, and president of Seven Stage Advisors. Welcome to the program, Carl. Hey, Mike. Thanks so much for having me. Hey, so uh, let's get started with telling us a brief background of yourself and what led you down the path of the entrepreneurial journey. Yeah, well, I think I've, I've, there's been a part of me that's always been entrepreneurial. Um, I grew up in a very big family, and, you know, I think the statistics are that one out of 15 people, one out of 15 people will start a business. And uh, in my in my family, five out of ten people started a business. So I think I it was a little bit in my DNA. But um, the uh, you know it was one of those things where I, I think it was kind of bred into me. But you know I got kicked off in uh, I went to college, uh, University of Delaware actually for accounting and finance. And in my second year, I broke my leg pretty badly and I had to leave school. And um, that when I finally recovered from all, I got started in my. Uh, I, And that was a landscaping and design build construction firm. I grew that business, sold it, and then started another construction company, sold that in 2004. But then I, the business I have today, I did part-time through the 90s, but then launched it in 2002, and that's what's brought me to today. Yes, yeah, so uh, that is the Seven Stage Advisors, correct? Correct, yeah. So I love um, the concept of Give me a blueprint to follow or a checklist to work off of so I can check things off, and that makes me happy. I'm not an engineer type person, but I, I find myself, um, probably you've done the same thing where it's like, ooh, I'm going to add this to my to-do list just because, so that I can check it off. So I'm certain that Seven Stage Advisors has something to do with creating a process or a blueprint or a, you know the seven stages. So tell us a little bit about um, how those seven stages came about because I'm sure that you, you one day um, started off and you were telling some clients these two or three things and then they morphed into here are my tried and true and proven seven stages that I advise clients on. Right on. I mean, you nailed it. So here's what happened. I was in the 90s. I, in 1991, I went to a Tony Robbins seminar and really, really uh, – fell in love with personal development and I got involved in, in life coaching and professional coaching back then, but there were no systems and mm -hmm. I was doing behavioral analysis, you know, like disc assessments and that sort of thing. And I started to notice these patterns and through, you know, through working with a few thousand clients, I started to notice, you know what, there are these seven stops along the way to success that every company seems to be going through. I wish it was three. I was hoping it was two or four, but it seemed to be seven. And, and, I, and I noticed every client that tried to leapfrog or get past one of these stages got punished. And it was the reason why they got stuck. So I realized that this is a linear track and you need to maximize each stage before you go to the next stage. And it doesn't matter how long you've been in business or how short you've been in business. Um, but these are the business functions that need to be attended to in order, in sequence, in order for our company to grow. And I realized my biggest takeaway from all of that is when you are a growing business and you have created a plan and you want to go to the next level, there is a sequence and you do not violate that sequence um, or you will be punished. And, um, and so that's what led to the creation of the growth cycle and the success cycle and 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 how I got to those seven stages. Yeah, I, I I love that, and I've seen that so many different times where you're just you know nose to the grindstone, head down, helping clients, and then you start noticing things like, well, you know what? When this is done before that, then this happens in a good way or a bad way, and then you start just fine tuning, and then now you've got this thing and the seven stages. So I, I love that uh, that setup. What do you think is one of the most critical skills that business owners need to master? And I'm sure one of these are, are one of the stages, but kind of give us a little bit. A lead in on on a critical skill that business owners need to master to succeed and thrive today in, in today's economy. Well, you know, we're, we find ourselves in very interesting times, and um, 
you know, we're in a season of business called winter, not because it's kind of winter on the calendar, but because it's, we, the, we go through these 20 to 25 year cycles where the way people buy changes dramatically. Mm. And, you know, so you've heard of the baby boomer generation. Every 80 years or so, a new baby boomer generation is born. And for 20 years, there's a way that people buy. We get to summer, which was 1965 to 85. Then we get to the fall, which was 85 to 2005. And is anticipated will go through 2023. <clears throat> and interestingly enough, during winter, the number one way that people buy is, and it sounds counterintuitive, with all of the volatility that we've had since 08, 09, people are willing to spend more for your product and service if they believe you're an expert in your field. So the critical skill for winter, now, Maybe seven years from now, the answer is different. But for the next seven years, you need to build your authority and your expertise and understand what your core target market considers expertise. Because once they know where you are an expert, right, then they, will be, they want more of you. And they're will, not only are they willing to pay more for you, they expect to be charged more for it. And during this time, uh, Mike, if you price yourself in the middle of the niche, you are thought of as noise. You're thought of as irrelevant. Mm. You're thought of as Kmart or Sears or uh, linens and things. Which other business went out of business recently or is shutting down shop? But you can't be in the middle. You have to be at one extreme or the other. And um, so the critical skill is I need, to, I need to know where my area of expertise is, number one. Number two is I have to find out what is the most my clientele is willing to pay and you get – there is no honor in being a discounted middle-of-the-road price uh, 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 provider. You need to be at the – you need to either be the lowest or at the lowest price or at the highest price because that's what your customers are looking for and that's what you really need to give them. And so that's – That's a that I, piece I, of advice and I – couldn't right. agree any more. In fact, that's the, the premise of my uh, latest book. And what I've seen myself in research and practical application, and I know you'll agree with this, so, so let's think of it like what you just said. If we start competing on price, the comp competitive landscape is your competitor then goes down and you go down and you go down and at some point – you just are at a race to the bottom, and depending on your yep. pockets and your competitor, <clears throat> you know, and I use this example a lot, I think Donald Trump still has a water company, like bottled water. So uh, when I was teaching a class on branding uh, a few years ago, I used this example. I said if we wanted to start a water, bottled water company and compete against Donald Trump, he could lower his price to a penny a bottle, and or he could pay people to buy his water, put us out of business, and grab that market share, and now raise it right on back up to this to higher than what he would have. And the point there is, we have to compete on value. Well, <clears throat> when you have that expertise, status, prestige being built into the preframe when before your clients or prospects even begin talking to you. They, like you said, expect your pricing to be higher. And then it's almost like that cold water being dumped in your head if you come in at some, uh, you know, bargain basement pricing and immediately their perception of you and your service and your results are now relegated down to the, the whatevers of the world, the Walmarts or the whatever. So um, I, I even had a colleague of mine say that they were prepping to – submit this proposal to a, a, a major corporation and they, their friend that was on the inside was the liaison. And this person said, you know, Hey, here's the package and here's my pricing. And they said, Hey, the package looks awesome, but you cannot charge that amount. Right. And the person was right. like, Oh, I can lower it. No problem. And he goes, no, 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 no. You need to triple it. Raise it. Because if exactly. my boss sees that price, they will scratch you from the agenda immediately because they will feel like there's no value in what you're offering. 
But what have you found with business owners when you start talking about that and they themselves don't believe enough in their product or service to raise their prices enough because there's that gap. They've got to come to that mindset shift to where I need to raise my prices and here's why I'm worthy of it. And then they need to see the results for themselves, right? Yeah, I mean, if you think about it, who do you know, and I'm sure you've known, you know people that fall into this category, who do you know that bought a Rolex or a Tesla and then complained that it was too much money or they complained they got ripped off? Yep, n- nobody. You would rarely yeah. hear, no, they're like, this thing was 10 grand, I'm proud of that. Yep. I spent my life, uh, you know, admiring this brand, wanting to be part of it, and I feel like I've reached a certain, you know, level in my life where I can actually participate in this brand. You know, you hear people getting complaining about Walmart, and that's not got nothing to do with Walmart. It's just a different kind of buyer because when you're competing on price, so here's for the listener, um, you know, being the low-cost provider isn't necessarily a bad thing, but you be, you're, you're now in a volume game. And if you're listening to this podcast, you probably can't win that game. You're, you're not Google. You're not Walmart. You're not Ford. You know what I mean? You're not eBay. You, you probably can't win that game. You have an easier time winning the game of being the higher price. So if you were to, um, so if you were to try to become that, you would just alienate your client base. And this group wants, wants to brag that they are part of this, this you know, community of people that can participate in what you have to offer. And the rate at which the population is growing and the rate at which the world is becoming interconnected, you don't have to compete. There's a niche out there dying for you to define it and dominate it because there's, there's a market for everything. But the last bit is, uh, on this mic is, if you, if you ever hear your prospect say to you, you know, we're talking to somebody else and they're a little cheaper, all that means is, is that you have not defined or differentiated yourself enough mm. that if you're getting the price objection, this is anybody out there. That just means they think of you like somebody else and that you should take as great feedback and say, you go back to your team and say, you know what? I got the price objection. That yep. means somebody, they think of us like somebody else. Folks, let's go back to the drawing board. Where do we need to further differentiate? Because as long as you're getting the price objection, you're a commodity. But if you're, if people are just saying, they should be saying this to you, Mike, Oh, ah, you know, that requirement you have on us to work with you, be it price or be, I got to fly somewhere or, it, you know, we start at midnight or, you know, it's during the week or it's during the weekend. Gosh, I, I want to figure out a way to make it work, Mike, but it's really a stretch. That's almost the response, almost to the word, the response you want to hear from your prospects where it, t- it, it twinges a little bit. They want to make it work. It's a touch of a stretch, but they want to work with you. That's how you know your message, your pricing, and your product are right on target. You know, it's interesting. I've got two things uh, that I think you'll really uh, get a kick out of. One is what you just said is um, I saw this meme online recently where it said something to the effect of, why don't you stop telling me I'm too expensive and admit the fact that you can't afford me? You know, and and it really is that, that aspect that it's not the price itself. You've got to just fully describe all the value that you're getting. And sometimes the value is the fact that you're running into cool club and you have the whatever. And so that leads me to my next uh, example. About a month ago, I was at a three day event and Tony Robbins did a half day at the last day, you know, and you, you know how that went. You're just unbelievable. Yep. Well, one of the things he did, um, and he was talking about this very topic. He goes in the audience and he goes, okay, uh, someone right now, uh, give me, uh, give me a, 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 a purse. You know, ladies, uh, give me your purse. You know, it's like a high end purse, right? So he, he because the he, purse, was, I he was short on lip because he was short on lipstick. Of course. Well, right? I, 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 no, I think you're trying to make a business point, and it was interesting. Now looking back on it, um, that. I, I don't think he qualified it. I think he just said, ladies, uh, who's got a purse? And this one lady in the one of the top front rows holds it up. He grabs it, and he goes, okay, how much do you pay for this? She says, $2,400. And the whole crowd was like, what? I can't believe it. And he's like, well, what is this? And it was a whatever brand name, right? I don't know. 
Versace or whatever that it was. And he just was railing on her. He's like, why did you pay that? Why did you pay that? And she's like, I want to be associated with that brand. And I thought and I knew and I always wanted to have whatever, right? And he goes, okay, uh, someone else, give me a give me a purse um, that didn't pay twenty four hundred dollars. And this other person, and it was like um, it was a backpack looking purse, right? Well, this other lady holds hers up, and he goes, "Okay, where'd you get that?" And she goes, "Walmart." Would you pay for it? Fifteen dollars. And then the whole crowd was going nuts. And he then proceeded to just give this whole demonstration of what's the difference. Because and and he asked the twenty four hundred dollar lady, "How much do you think it costs that company literally in hard?" you know, goods to make this. And she was like, I don't know, 20, 30 bucks. And he's like, you're probably right. But what was the difference? And it was the status and it was the yep. brand association. And it was how you feel when you, maybe other people don't even know it right off, but when you reach for that bag and you know, and you're walking just that little bit with more of a spring in your step or a little bit more, you know, credibility in your own mind, because you know what you paid for that thing, and you're associated with that. And I think that is really a huge piece that business owners need to keep in mind is, yes, it's the, the positioning and the mind of the target audience that they perceive you as that higher when you are in that realm. But there is another element that I'm sure there's a psychological study on. I just haven't found it yet. But there is something that happens in you when you start seeing yourself as that higher level, and then the first person pays it, and the second person pays it, and then you go, doggone right, I'm worth that, and then maybe you raise it even more from there, and then you start looking at your value and your products and services even higher because, huh, I never would have thought it, but I raise prices and people are paying it. Right, right. You're exactly right. I mean, Apple has done a phenomenal job of this. Their phones don't cost that much more to make, and their laptops don't cost that much more to make, but they are almost double. I bought – I remember I just bought a laptop, a, a PC, and I, I got it, like, you know, fastest RAM, terabyte of, a terabyte of, uh, of space, of uh, memory, sorry, and all the software that I needed. And, I, and it was like $1,500, which is an expensive – relatively expensive PC, yeah. like basic PC. I looked at the comparable Mac, and it was $3,900. And yeah. it actually didn't match the speed and the, the – the, uh, what I really needed was a terabyte. I needed the – what is it? The 8 mega RAM and the terabyte of storage because I, 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 I'm a mobile guy, so I need that stuff. I couldn't even find the Apple that had that, but it was double the price. And yet, you know, people will – if I were to say – hey, I bought this Asus laptop, they'd be like, who? What? Yep. Why'd you do that? Yep. And if I said, oh, I got this new Mac i Pro, blah, 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 they'd be like, wow, dude, wicked cool. You know, yep. because you know the Apple's done handshake. a phenomenal... Yeah, Apple, and they've done a great job of that. So, the, um, uh, yeah, so I, I, one of the earliest lessons I learned in business was that the, the prospect or the client will pay more for the intangibles, the experience, of the product or service, then they, w- uh, they, w- then they will the utility of the product. So that lady from Walmart, she bought a $15 purse, and if she bought a $15 from Walmart, I could tell you what, at, what it cost. I know how much it cost because I sell a lot of stuff to Walmart. It cost 3 or $4 to make. That $2,400 one probably cost 50 bucks to make, right? Probably cost 50 bucks to make. And, but there's not a big difference between the cost. But if you think about it, to go to Walmart, I paid $13 for the privilege to, to carry around a $2 uh, backpack. But the other lady, I paid $2,300 for the privilege of carrying around a $100 purse because the nameplate. And, and that goes back to this whole winter discussion, Mike, that you know Walmart is the expert in low cost. And that person who bought from Walmart, she thinks she's super smart. And I'm, you know what? I feel even smarter that I carry that backpack. And when I think of that lady carrying that, that Louis Vuitton Versace clutch purse or whatever, I think I'm smarter than her. But the other lady thought, I'm top of the food chain when it comes to status. And you know what? I don't need to be smart because I got status. And so my status is higher than you. So both of those ladies won. They won their personal psychological war for what I want to buy and how I identify myself. And so, 
you know, the psychology, you said, what's the psychology? The psychology is, is that the strongest force in the human personality is the need to align and, and behave with how they define themselves. So if I think I'm the smartest tool in the shed, I don't buy a Rolex. That would be dumb. A Timex is a better timepiece. But if I consider myself to be premium, I'm front of the plane, back of the car kind of guy, well, then I'm absolutely going to wear a Rolex. I don't even care if it's broken. I'm still wearing it. It doesn't have to tell time. I don't need it to tell time. I'm in the front of the plane, the back of the car. Someone will tell me the time. See yeah, what I mean? um, so it's how I define myself. Um, I, I'm looking at my uh, notes from the Tony Robbins presentation, and th- I wrote something down exactly what you're saying. People will overpay for significance. There you go. Bingo. Isn't that huge? Absolutely. Absolutely. You know, the, the, military, the military knows this quite well, and they say that men, and they, it's an old expression, so men or women, men will die for medals. Yeah. Yeah. You know, so they'll do anything because if they know they're going to get the reward, the acknowledgement, the accolade, or the, you know, the, the award or the reward, they'll die for it. And but yet that same, that same person, do. if someone were to say, hey, can you help me move this uh, weekend with your truck? They'd be like, no, nah, I'm busy. I don't have – Yeah, but, but you know what I'm saying? <laughs> because yep. it's like, what's in yep. that for me? And they probably, if you had someone with the little sensors on their head and you were giving them a lie detector test, they probably <laughs> would – the one saying no to helping the friend move, they're probably like uh, – I didn't think anything of that. I just was, was going to watch the football game. And, the, and right. talking about the medals, they were probably not saying, I want the significance and the recognition. It's just this ingrained thing. Well, if we know that about human psychology and buyer psychology, um, and, and I would suspect that a lot of your clients fight you on that, meaning, I uh, can't change my whole thing. I'm going to lose clients. Well, guess what? Why don't you don't just do it do it silently for the next three or four or five proposals you send out? Don't put it on your website and, and tell the world, but just just goose the numbers a little bit and just see what it does. And then at that point, once you've proven to yourself, now you can do some you know company wide things. So is that kind of the the mentality with closing that gap that you have seen with clients? With you know how do you get them to finally kind of raise their their perception? Yeah, they, that, that's a really good exercise to take on and, and beta test that with people who you think would already, uh, would already um, be open for influence, open for the conversation, right? Um, one quick growth hack you can use here um, is uh, this I learned this, literally the third day on the job on my very first business was um, I learned that your buyer – is thinking about the complaints of work and the negative side of working with you rather than the upside, um, unless you sell a dream bucket item like a Rolex or a Tesla. Mm-hmm. Um, and, and so here's the growth hack is you write down what are the top five complaints about your industry or companies like you. And you take those five complaints. So Netflix did this when they first started out. They were mail order DVDs. So they said, what's the top five, um, top five complaints about renting a video from a video store? Well, one and two were, I got to go get it and I got to bring it back. Number three was, you know, I can't buy it. Number four was, I, um, there's penalties. You know, number five was, you might run out of titles. So mm-hmm. Netflix said, look, if you want to keep going to Blockbuster, knock yourself out. You can, you can experience all that. We promise, we guarantee those top five things that are on your mind will never happen to you if you are one of our customers. All we ask is you put your credit card on file and you walk back and forth to your mailbox. Just pay mm-hmm. for whatever you use. Mm-hmm. And they took Blockbuster down. So the path to eliminating your competition and getting underneath the skin of your clientele is not to continue to pound away at all the positive upsides of your offering. The way to do it is to find out what the complaints are, promise the clientele that will never happen to you, and then create a premium offering around that. Yeah. Okay? So think about this. I tell you, you, you tell me, my, Carl, I'm taking my family to Disney World. Now, there's a lot of positives, but what are the negatives? There you are. You're there in Orlando. What are the neg- you're in the park with all your kids, your family, whatever. 
What's the negatives? What's one negative? Uh, the cost of the food in the park. Cost of the food in the park. Okay, so that's one. All right. So we have a point system where you can you can reduce the cost of the uh, cost of that. Number two, what's the other one? You're waiting where? Yep, waiting in line. So we got fast waiting track. in line, so that you can go fast track. So if you buy here, so here's what happened to a friend of mine. He not only bought the fast track, but guess what he got? Vouchers to lower the price of the food. So if you buy this fast track package, guess what we're going to do, Mr. Uh, family Man uh, and, and, and Mom and Dad? You don't have to wait in line, and we're going to give you family discounts in all the restaurants. Brilliant. So what, what do you think they did? If you buy this special ticket, that ticket is worth more than the food you would spend. Yep. Right? It would be yep. that elevated ticket price. It's a premium. He could have bought all the food with the premium, but guess what? I don't have to wait in line. So or you took or he right loved the, the time savings and the margin on the food is so astronomical that whatever the discount on the food was just a little sliver off the top. So either Bingo. way, Disney wins, but, and he wins because in his mind, he got what he wanted, either a discount or the saving of time or both. Exactly. Exactly my point. And, and if you think about it, now if I were to say this to somebody who's not a fan of Disney, they would say that's a total ripoff. But if you're a family member, if you're a family and you're going to Disney, what are you there for? To save a dollar on a hot dog or are you there for the experience? Right. And and guess what else you're there for? To get as much experience in as you can. And I can tell you, you I was at Disney two summers ago in California, and you don't get to see everything you want to see because of the lines and the time involved. So if you can compress some of that time, now you're cramming in more family experience, and, and you can never get time back. So I think that's a big, big piece that when we're talking to customers, how can we save them time? How can we save them money? How can we amplify their experience? And then that gets priced into our premium package. Right. And, and think about this, which I found very, very interesting. My friend comes back from Disney, four kids, his family, the whole bit, the whole family went down. He could have talked about everything, how great of a steak he had at this restaurant or the way Mickey tucked him in. You know what he talked about? His premium pass where he just zipped through the lines. The kids weren't complaining. Like the kids weren't like, Dad, when do we get to go on Space Mountain? Dad, when do we get to go to Jurassic Park? None of that. He's like, guys, it was brilliant. He goes, I had such a fun time with my family. We played. We enjoyed. I didn't wait online. By the way, he didn't have to wait online to get the food that was discounted as well because he got that fast pass. Of all the things that he could have said was great, he talked about the lack of line, which he paid a premium for. So he paid more for it, and he bragged about it. And I'll bet if we could have turned back time and put those little sensors on his you know, endocrine system – Every single time he was passing people in that line, getting in <laughs> to the fast pass, I bet it was going ding, 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 and lighten up, lighten up, it. because in his mind he's you know. like, "Look at me, right?" And I think right. that that's a big, big piece of why people buy. I, I just I think we could talk about this for about three and a half more hours because it's so important. And guess what? Half the battle is the business owner slash entrepreneur that needs to get over that in their own mind. Because they need to realize their prestige, authority, expertise, all of that, so that they can give that same feeling to their client base. And sometimes it's just hold your breath and goose that price up and see what happens. And then it's kind of like when you put your house on the market and it sells in one day, you're like, shoot, I should have listed it higher. I would have gotten that too. Yeah, so if you, you use Tony Robbins as an example. When I went to his first seminar in 1990, it was $595 to attend. Mm. <clears throat> and you can still, 30 years later, attend, 26 years later, you can attend a Tony Robbins seminar for only a, couple, uh, a few bucks more. I think for $600, you can still attend his seminar. But he sells more. He has VIP and platinum level seating. He sells more of those upsell up seats than he uh, now than he used to sell general admission back yep. then. Yep. The more he raises the price of those seats, the more people buy those seats over the general admission seats. What is that telling you? You know, what is that telling you? You can watch you can watch virtually the entire seminar on YouTube. You can watch yep. you can buy his tapes and hear most of it. And, for and, and what, what better experience are you going to get 20 rows closer as compared to 20 rows back? But doggone if you're not in the VIP section. 
There you go. Because yeah. I'm a VIP everywhere in my life. Of course I'm going to sit in the VIP section. The, his, his pricing model has showed that there's a demand. And if look, if nobody was buying them, he wouldn't keep doing it. But, but you know I what? I can Here's tell you by knowing him to, that they expand. We need to realize this for entrepreneurs listening to this. Um, if that same model was for Biff Johnson seminar, nobody's paying any VIP anything because they're like, who's that? So Tony Robbins was... Biff Johnson, day one, he he had to prove himself, prove the experience, have those 595 seats only to then have people raving about that experience so that then he can go, now let's give them a little bit more of the experience. So for some of the business owners today, they cannot jump into you know the VIP and the high, high, high premium day one because you've got to prove your model out and you've got to get that social yeah. proof. You've got to get your clients and customers raving online on your website, whatever, so that then you can go, oh, now here's my base package. But if you'd like to have my premium package where I, whatever, fill in the blank, and, sure. and you don't even need to say, because look at all these other people that loved it. It's just part of the feeling. So I think that's a big piece, too, is some of the best marketing is a job well done. Uh, there's no question. I mean, just to finish off on this point, um, I went to uh, one of Tony's seminars in 1990. The reason I knew about it and I went was my sister went to one of his seminars a couple of years earlier, and he had a seminar then, which is the same title now. It's called Date with Destiny. Um, to, to give you an example of where Tony started, and everybody started in the same place, she attended that seminar at his house. Wow. <laughs> That's when he started. He was giving these seminars to 10 and 20 people. Yeah. So, um, you know, he talked about his castle, stories about his castle from years ago. That's where he held the seminar. Wow. You know? So, I mean, everybody started. Everybody yep. start, look, Steve Jobs started in a garage. Yep. Uh, Bill Gates started in a hotel room. Robin started in his living room. Everybody starts in the same place. The, the question is, do you do a job well done? Do you understand what your clients really want, and you're not afraid to give it to them? Take the risk and go all in with your clientele. And they want the best of you, and they want that best of class pricing model from you. So anyone who's listening on, on every, any level, there's a part of your clientele that if you don't do that, they're going to go find someone else to do it with. Yep. And with that thought in mind, I mean, it's, that's just like drop the mic. Um, what's the best way people can get in touch with you, learn more about you, your books, your programs, your speaking, uh, your packages? How can people uh, reach out and learn more from you? Oh, great. Thanks. It's, uh, so you can reach me through carlgould.com, C-A-R-L-G-O-U-L-D.com, or just email me directly, carl at carlgould.com. Well, Carl, wonderful uh, uh, having you on the show today. Love your energy. Love getting to know you, and um, look forward to circling back around with you at some point as well. Mike, thanks so much. Really appreciate it. You've been listening to Influential Entrepreneurs with Mike Saunders. To learn more about the resources mentioned on today's show or listen to past episodes, visit www.influentialentrepreneursradio.com.